I would like to explain you a story which starts in physics. Of course, that story isn't, isn't new. Uh, mathematics and physics have developed together for, one could say, um, centuries, possibly millennia. But there is some very exciting recent work that really going back 10-15 um, years, which brings um, a new subject in mathematics, namely algebraic geometry, very much into the focus of physics, or com uh, conversely, um, physics into the focus of algebraic geometry. And that was totally unexpected, um, and I hope to present you um, that story. So I've chosen a simple example, which is physics on the circle. So I'm going to take you through some very, very basic cartoon physics in the first part of the talk and hope to uh, introduce one of the basic ideas which connect um, physics and mathematics, which is the idea of duality. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm hoping to show you by way of, of one example, which was historically very important, um, how that actually happens and what sort of results can be obtained. So um, let me start with classical physics. So classical physics is um, essentially the physics um, going back to Archimedes and, and Newton. Um, so here we have some uh, space time, which I'm, uh, some, some space, physical space, which I'm representing by some kind of geometric shape. Um, and then we have physical space, and then we have a particle. So that dot is our, our particle there. And that's, that's moving around that physical space somehow under the uh, influence of forces. And so in this talk, I'm going to, in the first part, I'm going to choose a very simple space just to um, be able to show you some, some sort of cartoon calculations. So we are going to choose our space to be just a one-dimensional circle. So instead of being uh, three physical dimensions, we are just in one dimension, um, and we are going to imagine living on a circle. So just to show you that um, we are actually interested in this, our circle is going to be this um, rather famous circle. I don't know how well this is visible. There are some mountains here. These are the mountains um, around Geneva. And this circle is um, the Large Hadron Collider uh, that was um, it's come into operation quite recently. Um, so we are going to take that as our, as our cartoon circle. Um, so of course, everybody knows that um, somehow classical physics is uh, about the very simple equations of motion of Newtonian physics. So just to have one, one equation here, if I have a, a one-dimensional particle whose position is x, and I have no external forces, then Newton's equation just says that the uh, acceleration of that particle is, is zero because there are no forces. And then um, if you um, solve that equation, that's of course very simple. We get that we have some velocity, which is a real constant. And the energy of the particle is um, taking appropriate units, just um, half of the velocity squared. And the only point here that I want to make here is that um, in this case, in classical physics, the energy has a continuous spectrum. So I can choose my real constant, and, um, which is my velocity, and then I can take the energy, can take any, any positive value. So um, if I move over to quantum mechanics, which is our, our next uh, step in this development of cartoon physics, uh, what happens now is that in, qu in quantum mechanics, we don't have a well-defined position and velocity for that particle but that particle gets replaced by some kind of wave packet, which I'm representing with this kind of cartoon spray. So we don't quite know where our particle is, but there's some wave function that describes um, the location and, and really the, the location density of um, our particle. And the equation of motion changes um, from Newton's equations to Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation goes back, of course, to the 1930s. Um, um, not going to write this down, um, but I'm going to quote you the result, which is this, and that's a formula that we need to keep in mind. The energy of the particle now um, depends on, not on the velocity, we don't have a velocity. Instead, we have a quantum number, an integer number, um, n, and then r is the radius of the circle. And so the energy of the particle it can take is n squared over r squared, where we have n an integer number. And the notable fact about that is that we get a discrete spectrum. So in quantum mechanics, um, on a circle, the particle or, or our particle wave thing is not uh, supposed to take any um, uh, energy value, but um, it can only take discrete values. So that was, of course, the big, 
discovery of, of quantization, that um, the energy levels of a system fall into, well, depending on the geometry of the problem, fall into some kind of um, discrete set. So here is our, our discrete set. So it could be 1 over r squared, and 4 over r squared, 9 over r squared, and, and so on. And that level of physics is, is perfectly measurable. So um, this is something that you can, you can go to the lab, or you can go to the LHC, or you don't need the LHC for that. Quantum mechanics is a physically observed reality, so you can just observe these, these discrete energy, energy levels very easily. So the reason one wants further theories is that quantum theory does not incorporate one of the most naturally observed theories of, of nature, which is gravity. And there is some very good reason why there are fundamental difficulties in, in quantizing gravity. So um, I don't have the knowledge or the time to explain the whole story, but one of the theories proposed to overcome the difficulty was string theory. So string theory has now been around for about 30 years. And the fundamental um, new idea that string theory brings in is that you want to replace particles uh, by little loops in uh, physical space, which we call strings. And if you do that, then string, strings will move in space, just like particles. So in that sense, there's some classical aspect to it. Um, but then they, they also have internal motion pa uh, patterns, and, and the, all the sort of quantum fuzzy stuff is still there. And that's supposed to give rise to physical particles. So once again, you have your physical space. You have the strings vibrating, moving in it. And the various vibration patterns are supposed to correspond to uh, um, physical quantities or physical um, the observed particles. So um, if we now do string theory on a circle, then there is some very interesting geometric input which we start to see. Namely, so before, remember, the particle was at some particular position on, on the circle or our, our wave packet was sort of concentrated still somewhere locally on the circle. But now if I have a circle and, and if I have this wide piece of string, what I can do is I can sort of pull that string very hard and try and wrap, wrap it all around my physical, cir physical circle. So um, here in the LHC, what you might hope to observe, of course it hasn't happened at all, and I'll comment on in a minute why, what you might hope to observe is some kind of really elementary object, namely a piece of string, a piece of physical string, really winding around a few times in the collider. So if you do the computations, then what happens is that you have the energy of particular states is going to take this form. So here we have our n squared over r squared. This is uh, coming from um, our quantum uh, world. But now we have this additional contribution to the energy, which is m squared r squared, where m is the winding number, the number of times I wind wound the, the string around my circle. And they're both supposed to be integers. So this is still quantized. We still have sort of discrete states. We are not allowed a continuous set of states. What's remarkable about this expression is that whereas the, um, the quantum um, energy, part of the energy is in inversely proportional to R. On a relatively, in a relatively large collider, this is a relatively small quantity, so these states have relatively small energy, whereas the second contribution is very large. And that's, that is to say, and I said, to achieve this, you really need to pull this string, which of course has some resistance to being pulled. You want to pull it so hard that you can really wind it around your, your, your circle, your collider. So these, these energies are very large. And um, I've taken units here where you don't quite see this, but if you co go through the computations, this contribution here is absolutely gigantic, way, certainly way beyond what, what is actually physically achievable in, in the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider, before you get me wrong, wasn't really built to experimentally test string theory directly. This is, let me repeat, it's, it's just, you're just doing some thought experiments here. But from the form of the formula, you see that um, the contribution is going to be um, physically very large. So here R is the radius of the circle. So let me just repeat this formula here. So our energy levels are m squared over r squared plus m squared r squared, where we have two integers and then the radius of the circle. And um, 
here is the, the fundamental idea that you need to uh, understand about this formula. It's got an extra invariance property, which is, wasn't at all there when we only did quantum physics, which is I can replace my numbers n, m, and r. I can interchange n and m. And at the same time, I can take the inverse of the radius. And if you see that, that because of the complete symmetry of this picture, of this formula, that transformation um, keeps the energy the same. So once again, let me just repeat that. And this is going to be our fundamental new idea. This is going to be duality. Um, so I replace by quantum numbers. And the quantum number and the winding number I interchange. And I also take r to 1 over r. So what does that achieve? So that achieves transforming a small circle into a large circle and vice versa. It interchanges these very high energy winding states with something much more manageable. It interchanges them with, with our particle states. So here is our picture. So our small circle get replaced by a very large circle. And you can hardly see that, but these binding modes, binding states, get replaced by our more familiar particle states. So this is the fundamental new idea. So um, it's still pretty simple geometrically. I'm replacing one circle by another circle. But I'm changing something fundamental about it, this circle, its length scale. So something small got turned into something large. And at the same time, our fundamentally new thing, which was the binding state, gets replaced by something more classical, namely the particle state. Um, so whenever you see that situation in physics, you call that a duality. Duality will always involve a change in geometry. And it also involves um, our new complicated objects replaced by something simpler. Um, so in this particular case, what we are saying is that physics on a small circle is indistinguishable from physics on a large circle, where by physics we mean string theory. Um, and of course, if you start thinking about that um, philosophically, or, or um, it's, it's really quite a subtle thought, because it tells you that the inflation of the universe is maybe the same physically as the deflation of the universe, and the Big Bang and the Big Crunch. What are we talking about, really? So if string theory is the fundamental theory of the, of the universe, then we have some things to explain here. Um, so this example can be generalized. Um, there are, there's a wide range of examples um, where geometrically very different spaces get related through this operation of duality. Um, and that has been exploited by a large number of, uh, of researchers to get really interesting new um, phenomena in mathematics. So one much studied example, which is, my, which is where my own work lies, is um, called mirror symmetry. Um, and it's a famous example because of a historically important mass physics debate. So I just want to tell you in the last part of the talk, I just want to recall that debate or, or that controversy and, and the resolution. So um, this is now in um, my own subject, algebraic geometry. And so just to give you a flavor of the ideas, um, I'm going to recall this um, problem in classical algebraic enumerative geometry. Um, and I'm not supposed not assuming that you're going to understand the precise problem. What I just want to get across is there is some particular number, the number of rational curves of a certain degree on a quintic threefold. So the quintic threefold is a certain kind of geometric space, which is particularly interesting in the context of string theory. And um, you're looking for a number. You're looking for an integer number nd of certain types of curves. So uh, mathematically, this was an interesting problem. And mathematics produced some results. So in 1979, some guy proved that the first notch number is 2,875. Then about a decade later, Sheldon Katz, a uh, friend of mine, computed the next number, which is something like 609,000. And then roughly another five years later, some people computed the third number and came to the answer of 2 billion, so many million, and so on. So it was an interesting problem, and it generated interesting mathematics. And then came physics. And in one stroke, there was a paper that produced a whole slew of these numbers. So remember, mathematics took a decade or half a decade to produce the next number, whereas these guys in physics came and produced basically a power series expansion, produced all the numbers all at once. So here is your 2875. Here is your 609,000. And then there is a problem at the next coefficient. So this physics paper in 1991 claims that the first number was correct, the second number was correct, and they claim that the third number was not correct. This 2 billion wasn't quite right. 
Uh, the third number is only 370 million. And then they produced, and that's, that's very important, they had a method which didn't just produce these numbers one after the other by different methods. They produced the whole set of numbers all in one slew. So there's a dot, dot, dot here. This is just a computational difficulty. So of course, these numbers are getting very large. But there is a, this is coming from some power series expansion that you can just, just write down. Um, OK, so the question was, what's going on here? So which of these numbers is correct? So these are rather large numbers. So um, you can't just you know, take your Garbia threefold, your, your, your Quintic threefold off the shelf and, and just go counting. So of course, there had to be a, a, a resolution. There had to be a, um, uh, first a discussion, and then you know, something had to give. These two numbers can't simultaneously be correct. So um, there was a, a famous meeting in 1991 where at Berkeley, where on one side, red corner physicists, blue corner mathematicians. And so there was a bit of a standoff. Of course, both sides were explaining to each other you know, what were the ideas going into their computations. In this particular case, and in many other cases, these computations come from exploiting the power of duality in string theory. So this particular computation, what happened there is there was this particular shape, which was this quintic threefold. And there was another geometric shape, close related, but very different, where these computations involving these curves could be reduced to something classical. Exactly as I said in my earlier slide, something, something new, something string theoretic, gets replaced by um, uh, a, a more classical computation that's possible to, um, to manage. So these ideas had an enormous influence on development of, of pure mathematics in the last 20 years. So just to give you examples, the development of subjects such as gromov witten theory, derived geometry, non-commutative algebraic geometry, and, and one could list these subjects. There has been a very, very profound influence of, of these um, ideas on the development of pure mathematics. OK, thanks very much.